Hi there. Let's talk about comic journalism. In this lecture, I want to look at the way in which nonfiction comics sort of expanded in the latter half of the 20th century and in, into the 20th, 21st century with the comic journalism. What exactly is comic journalism? It's not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. Some of the very earliest broadsides we had were pictures telling stories about the news in a non-religious way. They were events of the day, and they were widely disseminated throughout Europe and Britain. Here's a German broadside of the news in London of the gunpowder plot. You probably recognize here he's described as Guido Fox or Guy Fox, and he was featured in the character of V for Vendetta. In the gunpowder plot, this broadside, we see not only the events of the day described in pictures, but it's also written in German and French and Latin. So clearly this, this publication was meant to really be the way in which people experienced a lot of the news of the day. And of course, we also have a very famous series of engravings by Francisco de Goya, where he describes the French invasion of his homeland in a series called The Disasters of War. Here he simply titles this print as Yolovi. I saw it. And it's a very powerful image of a man being pulled away from his wife and child as the soldiers are charging in, and his friend is trying to warn him that he needs to escape as he will surely die, and his wife and child may be spared. But of course, this heart-rending scene was not actually anything that Goya saw. Biographers now looking at his whereabouts at the time and the military action and where it took place, he would not have been in any vantage point to actually see these events unfold. He certainly heard about them, and then from his imagination brought this scene into being. And so this is a very interesting idea about comic journalism. It's not entirely factual. This is not a photograph of this event unfolding. And yet there's something about it that seems to speak true, real. There was events not exactly like this, but there were events like it that clearly did happen on this day many, many times over. And he sort of visualizes them for us. He gives us a way in to feel the heart-rending scene of a family torn apart as the army marches in. And that's part of the power of the illustrated news, the way in which the pictures give evidence to things that we can only imagine actually happening. Now, we've been talking a lot about Will Eisner and his work on the development of the graphic novel. He was also very influential on the development of nonfiction comics. He was in the military where he was given the job to illustrate the Preventive Maintenance Monthly and create instructional comics for the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army wanted to make their lessons more vivid and more memorable to the troops so they would take better care of their equipment. And so he set to work trying to create vivid, exciting, funny ways of depicting how you should handle your Army issue rifle. And so the Preventive Maintenance Monthly, uh, for many years, then once he had even retired from the military, he continued to come in and help illustrate their publications, which they found to be very effective in communicating these ideas to their troops. Perhaps one of the most telling examples of a modern comic of a nonfiction type is Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story and talking about the way in which people faced violence and intimidation in a nonviolent way. This was created originally by the Al Cap-owned comics companies, Toby Press and Graphic Information Services. 
and the artists whose names did not appear in the comic were later found out to be written by Alfred Hassler and Benton Resnick and illustrated by Cy Berry, 1957. This was originally published and distributed in churches and in social halls, and then there's been a Spanish version and a later an Arabic version, which appeared during the Arab Spring. Now, political comics, as we talked about before, the French Situationist comics, these are ones which really injected both a level of absurdity and humor, but they were making a very important cultural point, and they were saying things in a way sort of underscored their message by drawing from a number of photographs and illustrations and historical pieces of art that provided for this way to comment on life as it was lived. And this was very influential in the development of the way people could communicate about political realities. The comic artist Eduardo Humberto del Rio Garcia, or simply Rios, was a very famous Mexican comic artist who took it on himself to make a book called Cuba para Principantes, or Cuba for Beginners. It was first published in 1960s in Spanish, and then later it was translated into English in 1970. And this Four Beginner series really took off. It was a way in which of communicating political ideas in the way like the detournement, taking collage, uh, adding in your, your political message, getting people to really engage visually with these otherwise, you know, important facts that they were trying to communicate. And this was proved very effective and very popular. Cuba for Beginners was it been in print since the 1970s, and they spun off into more than 20 different titles. And so now taken on by a whole host of different artists and writers. This idea of the nonfiction comic, this way of sort of juggling pictures and words, was also uh, something that inspired the artist Larry Gonick, who began in 1978 to take on the entire history of the universe, really stretching from the Big Bang all the way into modern times. This was an enormously ambitious project that took many decades to complete, uh, but with incredible uh, pers- Persistence and vision creates a really fascinating synopsis of human history. And it's full of fascinating humor and commentary about the development of various technologies, the changes in society, and the ways in which we have both evolved and changed from our times in the past and the way certain issues continue to have happen again and again. It's really well-researched. Larry Gonick is a tremendous scientist who studied math at Harvard, and then from this he went on to create a whole series of other comics based on nonfiction subjects, everything from sex, physics, the environment, calculus, statistics, and even his most recent one, Hypercapitalism, him doing the illustrations, working with other experts in their field to bring about the best information available on these various topics in a very graphic and vivid way. Perhaps one of the most influential on the understanding of comics and the history of comics has been Understanding Comics, The Invisible Art by Scott McCloud. This uh, first appears in 1993. An interesting side note, the funding for this publication initially came from uh, support from the artists who owned 
the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. With all of their largesse, they began dumping money into all kinds of pet projects. And one of them was this book by Scott McClown, which otherwise probably never would have seen the light of day. It's a really an extraordinary comic. It takes as its premise an understanding that comics, as they are realized today, are not fully realized. They are not a complete art form that we got to look at them and understand them, not for just what they are, but what they can and possibly be. So in this case, it's not entirely a sort of history of comics. It's more like a manifesto, sort of a call to arms to people to take comics more seriously. And he does a really fascinating job looking at the way we perceive the world and how comics represent that perception that we have. It also talks very powerfully about the way comics work, uh, that they are not one picture and then another picture illustrating the words. They are, in fact, something that happens between the pictures in the middle of the gutter there, where we're when we move from one picture to the next, our mind makes connections and sort of forms into a story. So these are the better parts of this book, but it is a rather rambling and in some places even incoherent and misguided book in places, especially when it tries to look at pictures as having the sort of universal ability to communicate uh, as a way of talking about the power and primacy of pictures. These and other areas of the book show that he's really trying to, you know, speak to the, all kinds of different ways in which he sees the history and the importance of comic art. But as I said, you have to take some parts with a little bit more of a grain of salt. The man who's really responsible for the development of comics journalism in the modern world is the artist Joe Sacco, who began in his personally published sign Yahoo, talk about stories and events that he as a journalist would collect and report on. And in Yahoo, between one and six, eventually published by Fantagraphic Books, he began to go on travels to the Middle East, exploring the tensions and the violence that took place in Palestine, and Gaza, and uh, other war zones at the time. Joe Sacco is a, really an extraordinary artist who has really devoted a great deal of his life to understanding and illustrating and really probing into the incredible complexities of conflicts and trying to underscore the human costs of those issues. Here you see in Palestine in 1996, um, this is a great example of how he sort of has these big, overwhelming panels with the dialogue spilling around and the panels jarring, creating a sense of agitation and movement as he is sort of led around by his informants into the conflict of the day. Joe Sacco depicts himself in a rather sort of funny and humorous way in relation to the people he interviews, who occasionally can become quite intense and agitated in there, but for the most part, really feel very humane and grounded in their representation. Sacco is a sort of comic relief in this. You see him making mistakes, finding his way, being duped. And he puts himself into the story in a way that we are allowed to judge both him and the story he's telling, giving it a layer of honesty. It's like, in a way, he's allowing us to judge his interpretation of what he's talking about. Nonfiction comics have expanded into all kinds of news stories. Shortly after the 9-11 report was published, a graphic adaptation of that report was also produced. 
The artwork of it is a little bit dry and matter of fact, but the visual power of the story is very evident. The way in which it focuses on the people, the events, the action, and a lot of the things that are happening sort of all at the same time. So when we see a page like this, we're seeing multiple perspectives sort of piling up on top of each other. And I found that to be one of the most fascinating parts about the 9-11 report, was instead of reading the story through from beginning to end, we were really allowed to see the kind of complex mess and misinformation that happened on that day and the days following. Another example of the idea of comic journalism is Pyongyang by Guy Disley, who was uh, working in North Korea for two months, helping a French animator bring a project to bear. And he made this comic about his experience in North Korea, talking about his troubles, you know, trying to understand this oppressive dictatorship that has overwrought every part of everyone's lives there and his own incompetence in trying to understand what he could and could not do. Very interestingly, they, they had planned to actually make a live-action film of this comic, but it was canceled shortly after Sunny Mus uh, Movies was hacked in retaliation for them making a movie that parodied North Korea. The sponsor for the film version, Fox, decided to pull out of the project, and it vanished. So, graphic narratives have a very important role to play in communicating to us in a subjective way, giving us a feeling of something, an artist's perspective, an artist's take. And in this news where we want to see where someone honestly comes forward and says, this is my view, the graphic narrative provides that opportunity for the artist to speak about something they have seen and experienced.